about that. I'm coming with vengeance after my bride. For she has been fleeced. She's been fleeced. And that's all he said to me. So guess what I'm trying to do in my mind? I'm trying to interpret what he meant by what he said, and especially the word fleeced. I commented in my spirit back to the Lord. I said, Lord, I've never, I said, I don't know any of the pastors that I'm in relationship with that are fleecing the flock, because I know what that means. And he didn't respond. Several days went by, and I just kept trying to figure out what that meant, and I never got a response, and so I decided to Google the word fleeced. And I went through several words, synonyms, and then I came to the word cheated. Now think about that for a moment. And it just like leapt off the page, and that was it. And I heard in my spirit, I'm coming after my bride because she has been fleeced. And then I understood what he meant, because she has been cheated. If I came to you with a gun and I robbed you, I would take everything that you have. You see me robbing you. You know you're being robbed, right? Someone's taking from you and you see it firsthand. However, if you are coming to my convenience store and you're buying some potato chips and some cookies and a few drinks there and it's $19.78. And I only give you not the 22 cents that you're owed, and that's rightfully yours, but I only give you 12 cents. Guess what I do with the remainder? I put it in my pocket. You have no idea because you took the change, stuck it in your pocket. You had no idea that I did what? I cheated you. I took from you what was rightfully yours, and I just put it in my pocket. And I heard in my spirit that this is exactly what has happened to the bride of Christ. She has gone to church Sunday after Sunday, and you came in hurting, bleeding, broken, need of, of the power of God, needing truth. Needing revelation, needing deliverance, needing to know your authority, needing to know what to stay away from and what to embrace. But what has been the major diet of most contemporary modern Western churches? Messages that won't deal with confrontational issues. Right? We're afraid to touch the fringe elements of issues that could cause some of our people to not want to come back or cause some of our people to feel uncomfortable. We've developed a mindset that church is to make people feel comfortable. So we stroke behaviors. We get as close to the edge as we possibly can without making people feel uncomfortable. Therefore, we've not dealt with purity. We've not, we've not dealt with righteous living. We've not dealt with holiness. We've not told our people to abstain from all appearances of evil. We've not discussed what Ephesians says, to have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Talk to me. All right. We've not dealt with homosexuality. We've not dealt with sexual dysphoria. We've not dealt with rage and anger and lust and pornography and perversion of all sorts. But what we've done, we've stayed in the middle of the road and gave you enough information for you to survive a week. Meanwhile, you come in and your marriage is broken. You come in and your kids are crazy. You come in and, and you're in bondage and we're in bondage and we're confused. Am I a boy? Am I a girl? Am I, is it okay to do this? Is it okay to do that? And there's been no clear clarion call from the pulpits of this is the way of God. Walk in it. Therefore, the Lord spoke and he said, my bride has been cheated. 
not giving to us, the body, what is rightfully ours. We withheld it thinking it was for your better good. And the immersions are where Jesus is coming and is going to do in three seconds what the church has neglected to do. Does that help anybody? I'm going to say it again. He does in three seconds underneath the water what men and women of God have been afraid to declare, pronounce over people in three seconds. He comes with vengeance for his bride. I feel like he is a lion that will come over you tonight and roar over you for protection and for deliverance. How many of you are ready to receive that tonight? I, I, I'm telling you, I'm ready, to, I'm ready for it to happen this evening. I'm ready for it to happen this evening. So that's his answer, why the water, among many other answers, is that my church has been fleeced. If you go to a church that will not address sexual clarity, take your children and move as fast as you can from a house of accommodation that is interested in building numbers more than building people. Maybe that's just too much too fast. I don't know. All right. Okay. All right. So let's look at Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. I love this. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Luke chapter 6. The Bible says in verse 17, and he came down with them and stood. This is Luke 6, 17. He came down with them and stood on a level place with a crowd of disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and from the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon who came to what? Hear him and be healed of their diseases. They came to hear and to be healed. You're here tonight for many reasons, obviously, but some of you came to hear and to be healed. And I believe if Jesus did it in Luke chapter 6, that he desires to do it tonight. So they came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases, as well as those who were what? Tormented with unclean spirits, and they were healed. I find it quite interesting that the word torment is in this text. I just want to serve notice on the enemy that we're up to his schemes, his strategies, and his intent. That Jesus came to set people free from tormenting spirits. Let me tell you and show you what torment looks like. On the screen is an envelope. I received this envelope when I was ministering in North Carolina. I just preached. I'm sitting down right here speaking to a young person. They're getting the waters ready over here. They're making preparation. They're getting people in, uh, uh, in line. Folks are transitioning. So I preach. I'm sitting. I'm talking. Nothing else for me to do other than to minister at the water when they're ready. Talking to a 17-year-old. A young lady, 27 years of age, comes not to interrupt me, but to sit down right beside me. And when there was a break, she handed me this envelope. Now, this is an offering envelope that you see in many churches. Y'all remember the days when we had those, right? And so she handed me this envelope and said these words. This is my life. Four words. This is my life. I opened the envelope and I began to read it. And she's sitting here. I'm sitting there. PTSD. 
porn addiction, sexual sin, prostitution, heart problems, raped at 2017, OCD, shame, fear, unworthy, bisexual, adultery, facing divorce, depression, all forgotten sins, all sickness, all illness, mus- uh, muscle spasms, body weakness, and infertility. Now this is not a dozen people, not her family, but her. Now lay your eyes on that for a moment. That's pretty intense. It's beyond intense. I'm looking at this list, and I'm just overwhelmed. I really am. I'm I'm like thinking in my heart, this is a mess. This is not anything just to bat an eye and go, oh, we'll pray for you. This is is a, a mess. Look at it. I'm infertile. I don't know if I... I like guys better or girls better. Therefore, I'm just going to take both of them. I feel so unworthy, have shame. I was raped in 2017. I've traded my body for money. I'm addicted to pornography. 27-year-old girl. So I asked her a question. I said, that PTSD at the top, Can you tell me about that? And here's what she said. She said, at 17 years of age, I walked out of my bedroom down our hallway. It was a ranch home. Walked down my hallway, came into the living room. My father sitting in a lazy boy chair, recliner. And as I turned the corner into the living room, he puts a gun at the bottom of his chin, pulls the trigger and blows his head off. And then everything beneath that PTSD began to make sense to me. I can't even imagine it. And I I said to her, I said, this is 50 years worth of counseling and I can't help you. I'll just real honest. I said, "I, I I I don't even know where to begin with this. But I said, right over there, there's a man that'll meet you in that water. I was compassionate, sympathetic, empathy, all of that to the best of my ability, but I knew that there's absolutely no way I can undo that with anything that I say. This is what's outside the church. While we deal with church drama, feelings get hurt, not being recognized, not getting the notoriety, being ignored, somebody getting a parking place, not being invited to sing on the worship team, not being invited to be in leadership, and so you decide, well, I'm just going to whine a little bit and complain. While we do the church drama and theatrics inside the church, this is what's down the street from us. Am I telling the truth? I'm not talking about you guys. I'm talking about a whole other group. Can you imagine the torment this young lady lived through? She told me, and I asked her the question, I said, how in the world did you even get to church tonight? She says, my mama invited me. I go, where's your mama? She goes, she's in the back, but she's an addict. That's what she said about her own mom. She's back there, and she's an addict. I go, what she's addicted to? She said everything. But isn't it amazing when God begins to move that even addicts will invite addicts to church? If there is a possibility for authentic, genuine encounter with the presence and power and the kingdom of God.
notice what Jesus did in Luke 16. People came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And then look at what happened next. Do you see it? And then it says, as well as those who were what? Tormented by unclean spirits. Tormented. I don't know how many in your family that you know are being tormented. Does anybody know someone that's being tormented? I mean, in your neighborhood, in the, in the, in up and down your street, perhaps you know enough of what's going on in those homes, of what's happening, and now you're putting a word to it that there is torment going on in that house. And sometimes the torment has nothing to do with an individual's personal decision making. A wife whose husband's unfaithful walks out, leaves the mortgage, the bills, the car payments, and says, I'm done. I don't want the children. You can have it all. I found someone, someone else. While you see her at Starbucks with a stern and noble face, inside of her heart, there is this ravaging, this tearing, and the torment that's going on in her core. Do you know someone like that? Someone that just got relieved of a job? For the first time in their life, having to ask others for support, ask others for some financial help. Do you know what it's like, perhaps, to lay your head on the pillow and not know if you're going to be evicted in the next 30 to 60 days? Can somebody say torment? Sometimes torment comes because of the choices of others, the actions of others. But yet, torment is ravaging. It's debilitating. And oftentimes, because of the torment that's going on in a person's life, they turn to alternative methods to ease the pain. It may be a glass of wine the first night, first month, first few months, and then it doesn't work anymore. And to deal with the tormenting and the voices and the anxiety, and the oppression and depression, we go to two glasses. And that lasts and kicks in for a little while. And then somebody says, I see that you're really stressed out. Have you tried this? And then you try it, and it eases the pain. It removes the voices. You're able to go to bed at a decent hour and to sleep through the night. But then again, it wears off. And so two glasses of wine, and then there's some pill. Now there's two pills. Then there's weed. And I'm just using an example. And it may not be you tonight that's walking through that scenario. But torment, in the original language, means to be vexed. But Jesus came. Now listen to me, because some of you are sitting in this room tonight, and you're tormented. You feel inferior. You feel that you don't measure up. You feel that you're overweight. You feel that you're ugly. You feel that you're beyond your capacity to have greater earning power. It doesn't have to be where the devil just taunts you and torments you. Talk to me now. Of where there is a demonization in your life, but yet you're still being tormented. God has come tonight, hear what I'm about to say, to deal with every torment in your life. People are going to find unbelievable, pleasant freedom in this room tonight. Uh huh. I'm going to say it pleasant freedom in this room tonight. Now, this word torment. I looked it up in the Strong's, the original language. Canal students, you'll know what I'm talking about here. 
It means that this tormenting spirit is a harassing spirit. Have you ever been harassed by something? That just when you think that you're getting over something, guess what comes around full circle and begins to speak to you? This word also means that this tormenting and the tormentor will excite a mob against you. That it will cause a disturbance and trouble you and molest you. Now this is the original meaning of the word torment in Luke chapter 6. And that word molest means to pester or to harass someone in an aggressive or persistent manner. It means to be troubled by demons. I got great news to you tonight. That this Jesus who says, I'm coming with vengeance after my bride for she has been fleeced and cheated. That he is coming to evict every trespasser in your life. I'm going to tell it to you this way. He is coming to eject every squatter that is living and squatting in your life. That you've tried to get out, push out, fast out. In one moment, in a three-second encounter, Jesus is coming with fire in his eyes, with great vengeance, and he's going to set us free from the torment that many of us are experiencing in this room. Find in your Bibles, I want you to go to Acts chapter 10, verse 38. As you're turning there, I want you to look at this. Do you see this lady right here? As of today, we've taken over two million photographs in six and a half years. 41,000 plus baptisms inside Dawsonville, another 50 to 60,000 in places just like this. When I look at a photograph, I think it is the most beautiful form of art there is to me. Why? I love paintings. I, I, I love drawings. I, I love all forms of art. I really do. But there's something about photography. Because photography captures a moment that can never ever be relived in its purest state. I can try to describe this to you, right? Okay, let me try it. So I, I look at this and, and I go, you know, there was this lady in Dawsonville that got into the water and she had an issue. <laughs> and she stood in the middle of, of five people, four people, and Pastor Marty was in front of you. Okay, I'm trying to describe it. But when you see this, right? When you see this, um, it, it just takes on a different, I mean, it's like you're there. This is one like nanosecond captured and can never go away as long as we have this on film. On the exterior, you have no idea what she's walking through. If you saw her at a restaurant, if you're at Target and she's shopping and she has a few clothes on her, you know, on her arm and she's looking through things and you think, well, this is the most pleasant woman in the world. She gets into the water on this evening and then we hear about her life. Hello, I'm Barbara Cox. My testimony might seem small to some, but what God has brought me through is significant to me. I could not enjoy swimming with my kids during summer due to my fear of water. Now, I just want to pause right there. I want everybody to, to, to realize that you don't have to have something big to need a touch from God. It's not like that God has a reservoir of a certain amount of miracles in His pouch. And it's only reserved for people that have big issues. Like weeks to live or cancer in their body 
or they're deaf or blind or something along those lines. There is no great miracle and low miracle if you're the recipient of a life change. You hear what I'm saying? Your small issue, you may think it's small, but it's big enough in your life that it bothers you. And anything that bothers you, bothers Him. Any amount of torment is unhealthy. Talk to me. So He's concerned about it. He didn't push people away because He thought that it was not worthy of His touch. Children came to Him. And He said, do not forbid them to come to Me. Talk. Right? She said, it may seem small to you, but I've had a fear. I've had a fear of getting into the water all my life. My husband's drowning. Now watch this. June 2nd, 1974. Somebody do the math. From 1974 to 2024. 50 years of torment. Every time going to the lake, a pond, a swimming pool, private or public, you know what I'm saying, somebody's backyard or in the city park. Every time she would go into that water, there would be this fear. And also the remembrance of perhaps the paramedics, the fire personnel, the rescue people, at the edge of the lake, pulling her husband's body, lifeless blue body, out of the water. Fifty years. Fifty years of torment. Imagine the nightmares. The trembling. The shaking. The anxiety. This matters. But watch what happens. However, on week 330 of the North Georgia Revival, June, what? The anniversary of my husband's drowning and passing. I entered the baptismal pool and the Lord healed me of all my water-related fears and anxieties. Thank you, Jesus, and thank you, Christ Fellowship, for your compassion for everyone that walks through your doors. My daughter has booked a cruise for February 2025. <laughs> when she got into that water, he came. with vengeance and fire in his eyes and said, my daughter, I've waited a long time for you to come here. And it just so happened on the 50th anniversary of her husband's passing. And when she went underneath that water, the fulfillment of the vision he, God gave me, I'm going to baptize people with Holy Spirit and fire. That he moved in with such velocity and ferociousness that every tormentor left her mind and gave her a peace that surpasses all understanding. Can we give God glory right there? Come on, let's give him praise. You know, and I don't, I don't know about what you're walking through, and I'm not here to, to, to list them all. You, you know what it is. I feel and felt all day long that there was going to be something in, in, in the waters tonight that's going to happen that's going to set people completely free. 
This immersion tonight is a little bit different. Will there be physical healings? Absolutely. Will there be, will there be manifestations of God's power? Certainly. But He's coming after the tormentors in your life. I remember when Jesus showed up on the scene and they would ask, the demons would ask Jesus, are you here to torment me or to torment us before our time? Let me tell you what's going to happen tonight. The tormented is about to be tormented. I mean by the devil who is the tormentor is going to be tormented tonight. The one doing the tormenting is about to have things turned on him. And Jesus is going to kick them out of your life. I'm telling you, I sense it. I know it. I've watched it. I've witnessed it. I believe it with all my heart. <laughs> Look at Acts 10.38. I want you to see this. Acts 10.38. Are you there? While Peter, well back up, How verse 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all, do you see that, that were a what? Oppressed of the devil. How many did he heal? Okay, this word oppressed means that there is something or someone who's exercising harsh control over an individual. Someone that is undergoing continuous hardship. That... There's an outside entity exercising authority over you that's causing anxiousness and distress. He said in this scripture that he healed everyone that was oppressed by what? The devil. Do you believe that tonight? In your Bible, 1 John 3, 8. You're going to love it. 1 John 3, 8. The scriptures say this about Jesus' ministry. It says in verse 8, He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that He might destroy the works of the devil. Your torment is over tonight if you want it over. I'm going to say it to this side. Let me see if you get it. The torment in your life is over if you want it to be over. And I know you've asked and you have desired and you've cried out. But there's something that is happening tonight with revelation. There is something that is going on tonight that I believe that God says, I'm going to have a moment with my bride tonight. She's been cheated and I'm coming with vengeance and I'm going to set her free. I'm going to deliver her. Tonight, everything shifts. Everything changes. The grieving, listen, the sorrow, the, the, the stress is going to be It's going to be over tonight. I don't know if you believe it. Do you believe it? Uh huh. I, I, I think, I think we do. Let's talk about torment for a moment. I wish you could see the picture a little bit closer. But again, I just look at photography. I look, I mean, I love pictures of mountains and state parks and national parks and animals and all that kind of, I love that stuff because it captures that essence of that moment. And then I'm left to interpret it. You know what I'm saying? But this woman is at the foot of the baptismal pool. Right here is her sister or a friend, I believe it was. I, yeah, uh, I think it's a friend that brought her to the water. She could not get into the water, but she's sitting on this black chair. That's right there next to our baptismal pool. And here's the reason why. I'm the one Sunday with the issue of blood outside the pool. And then this message was sent. Hey sister, just catching up with you. Thank you for your sincerity. You showed me and my family a couple Sundays ago. Just to let you know the bleeding stopped the next day. Glory be to God for his healing power. So this woman had like a continuous cycle of 
sometimes more bleeding, um, sparse bleeding, but bleeding nonetheless. It was constant. So she could not get into the water. Guess what she did? She got as close as she possibly could. Because she had heard, now listen to this, what Jesus is doing in the water. Hearing is important. What you hear is important. Talk to me. What you hear is important. They came to Jesus. What, remember we read it? They heard about Him. They came to Him and to hear from Him and to be healed. Evidently, that girl in the background back there told her that Jesus could touch her. She could not get into the water, but she got as close as she possibly could get. Now, she did not use it as an excuse. Well, I don't want to get wet. I don't want my makeup to run. I don't want my hair to cling to my head. I don't want to be embarrassed. I don't want to wait in line. So can y'all just get me a rag or can y'all just put my hands? No, no, no. It doesn't work that way. Sometimes the Lord has to make it inconvenient. Sometimes you have to claw literally through a crowd. To scratch your way to him. He walked right past her. He knew she was in the crowd, but he kept walking. There were sick people all around him trying to touch him. But she said, if I could only get to him. So she fought, scratched, crawled, whatever she had to do until she was able to reach the hem of his garment. She did not have the mindset, if God wants me to be healed, then he will just simply heal me and wait on the side. She says, no, I'm going to touch him. I'm coming after him. He's walking by me. I'm going to do whatever I have to do, muster all the strength I can to get to him. Sometimes you can't get to him. It's not convenient. But the need is so great that you climb a roof and you tear off the, the, the roof tiles, the shingles, to lower your friend who needs a touch. Sometimes you just don't have enough strength or enough height. You still want to be with him. And sometimes you've got to climb a sycamore tree to put your eyes on him. And to be seen by him. we got to quit being lazy and throwing and hurling these prayers. God, you know I'm sick. You know I need healing. Lord, if it's your will, heal me. No, you have to understand the very nature and character of Jesus. That if he was standing here in his flesh and bone body, he would heal every single person that is in this room. So since I know that, there's not going to be a pastor. There's not going to be a teacher. There's not going to be an elder. There's not going to be a leader. There's not going to be a rule that keeps me from touching him. If it means I have to be at the end of the line tonight, I'm going to wait. It means I'm going to have not enough sleep to go to work tomorrow. I'm still going to stay until I meet with him in the water. My stomach may be churning. It may be growling. I'm not eating all day. But I'm going to stay because I've heard he's moving in the water. I'm not asking him to come on my terms. I'm coming on his terms. That mentality has got to come to a close in the body of Christ. That wherever he is, I'm going. Whatever the cost it is, I'm paying it. Wherever I have to meet him, that's where I'm going. Whether drilling a hole, whether fighting through a crowd, or climbing a tree. And thank God this woman, I can't get in that water. But I'll get as close as I possibly can. Look at her posture. I study the posture. Do you see the posture? Not arrogant, not flamboyant, not demanding, it's not woke. It's like, I don't even deserve this. Come humbly. But there was something about the water and the essence, the anointing, just around the water. So we get a text and we said, investigate this because we wanted clarity. Wrong one. 
Yes, I was bleeding when? Constantly since January. I have irregular bleeding since I was 12. And now she's 40. How many years is that? That's a long time. Three decades, nearly. Of torment. Can't go swimming. Got to watch yourself. Protect yourself. Cover yourself. Not even in the water. But she would have got in if she could. Can I get as close as I possibly can to where it has been documented that he's moving? Not saying, can you pray for me at the altar? There are times that we do that, times that churches do that, and it's important. God heals there. But God did not show me fire here. He didn't show me fire on the end of my fingertips. People will come to me and say, will you pray for me? I go, yeah, I'll pray for you. Well, I'm not going to get in the water tonight because I oblige them. I pray the best that I can. And some people have gotten healed. But it's not like what we see in the water. I'm not being ugly, but the, i got to be a steward of what he, show, what he showed me. Right, guys? You understand that. I'll pray for anybody. It's a privilege. But don't use that as a substitute. Are you okay with that? Everybody all right? The torment. I can't tell you what the body of Christ is going through. You know it. You see it. There is so much pain. In our churches and even in this room. Self-inflicted, some not self-inflicted. But the healer is here. I promise you this. You give him all when you get into the water. You give him all and he will give himself to you fully in the water. Thank you, Holy Ghost. I said, thank you, Holy Spirit. He's come to destroy all the works of the enemy. I close with this last story. Yeah. I think it's week 318. I'll show you a video of a miracle of a lady's ear that opened up. You may have seen it. Pastor Marty may have shared it when he was here. I don't know. But it's worth looking at again. But I want you to listen to the years that this woman's been deaf. And doing the best that she can and believing for a miracle. But on this night, he came and changed everything. It's three minutes. Watch this. I'll need volume on this, guys. Thank you in the back. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Well, they're your buddies in crime. Well, what's your, what's your name? And then what's your buddies in crime's name? Pardon me, Nancy. Nancy. And who are your friends? Yeah, we're friends. What's their names? What are their names? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to interrupt because Nancy's God. here for God to heal her hearing. Yeah, that's why we're testing out. And yeah, well, you you got it because she's she's had a one cochlear implant already and um, done 
the one, number. She, one for both ears or one for no, one ear? No, one for one ear. One for one ear. Mayo told her she needed a, one for the other ear. So she can hear perfectly fine out of one ear? No, not at all. She has had one ear, has been deaf for f over 40 years. 40 years. Which over ear has been deaf years. 40 years? This one was over 40 years. The left one, 40 yeah, years. Yeah, yeah. And you can't hear anything out of the left ear? I, I, had, uh, I had cochlear implant surgery last year about the same time this month. And uh, I lost this one two years ago, but uh, I qualify for cochlear again in this one. And, but I had a prophetic word that within two years, this hair is going to come back. But I'm planning on all of it coming back. Jesus. 40 years of torment. A three second encounter with the Lord. Embrace yourself, or brace yourself, I should say. Yeah. Brace yourself. Because in certain pockets, in certain churches, this will become norm. The men and the women that preach with expectation and fervency, with an urgency in their voice and trembling in their spirit where their body literally shakes because the kingdom of God is about to show up. We've not seen the kingdom in most churches. And we at Christ Fellowship have not seen it to the degree we desire. And that is possible. But the Bible says that when the disciples were sent out, He said, Jesus said, tell the people that the kingdom of God has come. Think about it for a moment. Jesus walked into that baptismal pool with that lady. And the kingdom of God came. There's coming a time where the kingdom's coming and it will shake us. We won't know what to do with it. Right now we know everything that's going to happen in church, when it's going to happen, how it's going to happen, and it's so polished, it's so pristine, it, 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 it is so marketable. I want to move a God that's not marketable. Unpredictable. Uncomfortable. 
that in the middle of your preaching, a woman burst through the back door, screaming, foaming at the mouth, throwing herself and rolling on the, ca- on the carpet. And those that have been praying, walking in authority and complete peace, do not become unraveled, but speak a word, maybe two, come out. Yet there's a residue of the foam and the vomit on the floor. But yet this woman walks around and begins to take on the rest of the service sitting and clothing in her right mind. Not a 28 minute message with a pastor in skinny jeans, press shirt. And a production. And you go home and you stop to eat on the way home and you live the rest of your life trying to climb the corporate ladder. There's coming a time when church is going to be completely ugly. Beautifully ugly. Can I say that? Do you understand what I'm saying? Where it's just, I don't know what's going to happen today, but I've met with him all week long, and my cry is for him to do whatever he wants to do. I'm planning, I mean, I'm planning, I've got an idea, I've studied, I think I know, but oh God, may the kingdom of God come. And in that baptismal pool, that lady leaning over with the issue of blood, he walked through every one of those baptizing, every one of them, and he touched the lady who was bleeding. Nobody saw him. He wasn't coming for the workers. He wasn't coming for anybody but her. And he came. And he says, daughter, I've watched you for 28 years. This is the moment. Daughter, I've watched you for 50 years cry yourself to sleep. blame yourself for his drowning but I'm going to remove all of that no one felt him walk through that water nobody felt the fire from the water but she did he's not for here he's not here for anybody else but those who are tormented tonight you'll find freedom tonight All of you for all of you. So Jesus, I thank you that the kingdom of God is coming to me. I know somebody think I've been baptized before. I've been baptized multiple times. Maybe tonight's the night. I know to do. Thank you for letting me be here. I love this house. I love these two people. I love the staff here. I love everybody. It's an honor. So let's get into the water tonight. And uh, if he calls you, go. Amen. I need to slip away for a few minutes. Okay. I need to slip away for a few minutes. Thank you, Pastor Todd. So if anyone's feeling impressed by the Spirit to get into the water and you didn't come um, plan with clothes, we have extra clothes. Men's is right over here on the other side of this white wall. Um, Changing rooms for the men are in the men's restroom. And then we have a whole table full of women's clothing. Um, You're going to go around and you're going to make a left. You'll find Nancy. You want to raise your hand, Nancy? Find Nancy and Leslie, and they'll help you get an outfit as well. And um, be sure to get a paper to sign out front. I don't know, Miss Sheila, if you want to bring some in. Um, so anyway, let's get our workers, the people serving in their spots. We just ask as everybody's getting ready, we just keep this atmosphere a place of, um, you know, honor and uh, prayer, prayerful. <laughs> 